Perched on a rocky spur some 300 meters above the Mediterranean, the town of Grasse enjoys an international reputation. For more than a century, this little citadel on the French Riviera has been the capital of French perfumery. It is here, just outside the historic town center, in the commune of Montmeillon, that Philippe Garneron is dedicated to growing one of the flowers that has made the reputation of his hometown. Its botanical name is Rosa X centifolia, the rose of a hundred petals. If you actually count the petals, there aren't a hundred, there are around thirty. It has evolved. It's a hybrid rose that was originally produced from an old rose that had 120 petals, if my memory serves me right. As it has developed, the petals have been lost along the wayside, so now it has only around 30. Rosa X centifolia has been produced from successive cuttings, so it's not a natural creation, rather man-made. Although its precise origins are not fully determined, we do know that it arrived here on the limestone cliffs overlooking the Mediterranean sometime in the 19th century. We're not far from the sea here. It's 15 kilometers as the crow flies and the pre alps are only 10 kilometers away. So all that combines to produce an exceptional rose. Being between sea and mountain creates an atmosphere where it can develop a scent that is impossible to find anywhere else. Provence roses from Grasse are coveted by perfume creators. They have inspired celebrated fragrances like Naima by Jean-Paul Guerlain, Trésor by Sylvia Grossman, and more recently La Petite Robe Noire by Thierry Vasseur. Hey, Philippe. Hello, Mr. Vasseur. How are you? For the nose of the prestigious Guerlain perfume house, it's essential to maintain the close relationships that unite Parisian perfumery with Provençal horticulture. Before me, there were four generations of perfumers creating fragrances, and they created with this rose, among other things. For me, in order to preserve the integrity of the formulae that make up our heritage, it's essential to keep a very close eye on what's happening here. The problem for perfume makers today is that there are only around 30 rose growers like Philippe Garneron left in and around Grasse. Large-scale urbanization of the Côte d'Azur is leading to a slow decline in the number of fields of flowers in the hinterland. That is why every spring everyone anxiously focuses on the sky and the weather which can threaten the year's harvest in a heartbeat. The Provence rose is a fairly tricky plant to grow. The buds form in May, when there is still a threat of frost here, and a hard frost or a hailstorm here could destroy the crop in a stroke. In April, we cross our fingers that there are no violent hailstorms or sudden frosts. Picking started today, it's mid-May, the season is underway and it's looking good. The month of May is so important for the last rose growers in Grasse because these roses only flower once a year between the last rains of springtime and the hot and dry Mediterranean summer. That's how it obtained its affectionate nickname of the May Rose. As soon as dawn breaks, hundreds of tons of petals are picked by hand and dispatched straight to the factory to be processed. At Roberté, they've been repeating the exact same process for more than a century to extract the fragrance from these fresh flowers. The flowers were picked this morning, and that way the raw materials are processed immediately. We put the flowers in the extractors and wash them several times with a solvent, usually hexane. It takes around two and a half hours for one operation. An operation in an extractor takes about two and a half hours, but it can sometimes take longer. Ex 
Extraction using a volatile solvent is a technique typical to Grasse. It was identified by chemists in the 19th century to gradually extract all the aromatic molecules of the rose without any unnecessary heating. During the first wash, we extract between 60 to 70 percent of the flower's olfactory potential. Then we do more washes to ensure we extract every last bit. After three or four washes, the flowers will have released all their olfactory heritage. For Thierry Wasser, extraction is a critical step in the path that leads the roses from the fields to the laboratory where he develops his creations. Just in time for unloading. Perfect timing, absolutely perfect. The flowers that were processed this morning are being unloaded. And there's the steam being released. The extraction is complete when all the solvent has been evaporated. For those pretty flowers that have now been totally exhausted, it's the end of the road. But they have left behind a mixture of aromatic molecules and vegetable waxes in the vat, which are known as concrete. This rose honey is what the connoisseurs are eagerly awaiting after processing is complete. We're like gourmets. Yes, you're right. The middle is still... Yeah, it's still hot, isn't it? It's still hot. Ah, it's lovely and smooth. It has all the characteristics of the Provence rose. It's extremely floral, warm and honeyed. It's a good start for the season. It's a start. It's really lovely. Exactly. But we should still be cautious because, you know what nature is like, things can change. And it's still early days. This is just the start of the campaign. It's a good start, but we need it to stay like this. The invention of the solvent extraction process was a revolution for the Provence Rose and for the entire town of Grasse. Advances in the world of fine chemistry at the end of the 19th century suddenly opened up the era of modern perfumery, putting the finishing touches to several centuries of gradual specialization in working with fragrances. It should be said that in the Middle Ages, Grasse was mainly known for having very stinky streets. They washed leather in the open air, and the smells filled the town. It stank of rotting carcasses, that's just how it was. The smelly water of the city of Grasse, where the tanneries were, ended up in the gardens in the lower part of the city. Then the first fragrances came from Spain and Italy that were used for perfuming the leathers, which eventually became a product that finally started to smell good. Once tanners, the people of class then became glove makers, then glove makers and perfumers, before they eventually abandoned all glove production to dedicate themselves fully to fragrance, thanks in part to the fabulous flora found in the land around the town. In the middle of the 20th century, the land around the edge of the town was still filled with fields of jasmine, lavender, tuber roses, and roses themselves. I was born in 1939, and it was in 1938 that rose production reached its peak. As a child, I remember that perfumed air during the month of May, because there were roses everywhere. Like in summer, there was jasmine everywhere. But then we were producing between 400 to 500 tons when I was a child. Those things have a deep and lasting impression on you. When I joined the company in 1959, which means I've been with them for 58 years now, when you traveled from the town center to Roberté here, it was almost all fields. There were fields of jasmine, violet, and roses everywhere. Even below the factory, there were jasmine plantations. There were lots of them. Today, there are none. Gas may now be the industrial capital of the French perfume trade, but it is having to fight tooth and nail to defend its agricultural identity from the real estate business. 